It's now my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker to share his insights on the imminent cybersecurity threats that face our nation, on the role of the White House in combating cyber threats, and to share uh, his, what other insights he may have for us in industry. Uh, Rob Joyce is the Special Assistant to the President and the White House Cybersecurity Coordinator. Previously, he ran the National Security Agency's <coughs> Hacking Division called the Office of Tailored Access Operations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rob Joyce to the stage. So let me thank everybody. I, I really appreciate the effort that's going into Cyber Maps. What, you, uh, what you're doing here is really the grassroots of connecting the people that have the knowledge and the capabilities in the cyber community. Uh, you'll connect them together as Cyber Mass connects under Cyber USA um, to other efforts in other states. It's really powerful. And what we've seen with a few people with really passionate ideas be able to do to change the whole ecosystem, whether it's the educational people that are coming up through or it's the, uh, or it's the, uh, the, the way we innovate and bring ideas to the forefront and make opportunities for people in business to find other like-minded people. It's just awesome. So with that, um, I'll start by just saying, you know, if we step back and look at the trend lines for cybersecurity, they're going the wrong way. Um, you, you only have to look at last week um, with the WannaCry um, activity to understand that we have, um, we have an environment that is tremendously dependent on our IT and technology. Um, and, and in that space, we continue to add and add and add with innovative things in our lives, but we don't always think through the repercussions and the implications of how the cybersecurity is going to be done right. So with that, um, you know, the, the, the current administration, the Trump administration put together a, an executive order to really get our legs underneath us for cybersecurity. Um, it was signed on 11 May, um, just, just very recently, and it has three main pillars inside it. So the first is securing the federal networks that we operate on behalf of the American people, and that's a, that's a really critical element. Uh, the second is working with industry to protect critical infrastructure that maintains our way of life. Um, and the third is strengthening our deterrence posture and building international coalitions because it's gonna take a coalition of like-minded countries um, to advance what is a global, global common space here in industry. So, if I'd like to really start by getting you to think about the federal landscape of technology, and I'll go into that first pillar. And, and it's not unlike what industry is facing too. So as I talk about the federal landscape, um, think about your companies or your clients' companies, and I think you'll see the direct connections here. Um, we have a massive investment in U.S. cybersecurity technology. The IT technology throughout government, um, we have something on the order of 200 departments and agencies in the U.S. government. And they go from really massive departments, like the Department of Defense that spends massive amounts of money on IT, um, down to the Marine Mammal Commission. Right? Small, doesn't have that tech background that others can bring. Um, inside those departments and agencies are national secrets. Um, there's the personal data of the American people. Uh, and, and there's even things like command and control of weapon systems. Right? So it's very important that we get this cybersecurity right. Uh, as I mentioned, some of those are really well-resourced efforts. Some don't have the same base to draw upon. So I don't want to pick on any one place, but i got to give you an example. So the Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation, right? that is a, an entity that focuses on the water um, and the opportunities with the water supply in this country. They produce um, a massive amount of hydroelectric power for this country. Um, they operate over 53 hydroelectric power plants, and in, over the last 10 years, has annually produced 40 billion kilowatt hours per year. So they're a major supplier for um, for our underpinning um, of, of critical infrastructure in the power industry. There's a lot of technology in that mission, but when you think about it, um, 
do they have the same cybersecurity focus that maybe the Department of Defense will have? Do they have the same talent? If you're coming out of um, Carnegie Mellon, an MIT, a Stanford, are you going to raise your hand and jump at that cybersecurity job in the Bureau of Reclamation, or are you going to go elsewhere? Right? And, and that's the reality we face in the federal government, but as well a lot of companies and industries. Um, so it, it was great having, you know, a, an overview of NICE and the, the, the state of our efforts to go and develop that talent. Um, but the reason we have such a focus on it is because there's not enough talent to go around. Not enough talent to meet all of the demands in industry and, and government. So, um, so we've got to think about what does that mean for our approach to doing cybersecurity. So in that first pillar, um, we really have to think about securing those networks. I mentioned we operate those on behalf of the people. There was an example where um, about 20 million individuals in government um, were impacted by the OPM breach in 2015. Um, it not only impacted government employees who had done security forms, it, it impacted our families, uh, our references, other people who were involved in those forms and also cited on those forms. So it was a pretty massive leak of personal information. Um, think about if that leak had not been OPM and security clearances, but maybe the IRS or the Social Security Administration, right? That's what I mean by saying we operate those data networks on behalf of the American people. There's huge implications if we go ahead and have some sort of breach in that. Um, so one of the core elements of this is really emphasizing cybersecurity starts at the top. So with this executive order, department and agency heads are responsible for the state of their IT. In the end, they make risk decisions, just like CEOs of companies. They decide to fund and refresh um, technology. They will go ahead and at times um, decide to um, allow a system that's beyond its end of life to continue because they don't have the funds to refresh that or decide that that's a technology that they're not going to invest in. So that's a decision to accept a risk and we want to understand those things. So I recently had the chance to sit down with the CEOs of seven of the top U.S. companies in a critical infrastructure sector. They spent a couple hours with me. That was part of a greater day where they spent the whole day talking about cybersecurity because they felt those cybersecurity threats were, um, were an existential threat to their business and their, uh, their corporation. So they put their time, their personal energy at meeting as, with their competitors um, to, to work on the ecosystem. And, and in that, they not only spent their time, they drew on expertise, um, this is time they spend together quarterly and then they go back to their to their companies and they spend more time with their people uh, working on their own businesses cybersecurity. Why do they do that? Because they literally recognize their company could die if they make the wrong cybersecurity decisions. Now the question for you is, do you and your companies put similar efforts? I think a lot of people in this room would say yes, you're here. But if you look around at industry, many don't. If you look at federal governments, at those department and agency heads, they may not be making that same investment. Um, so with the EEO, we're trying to encourage that kind of focus, right? Understanding how much is at risk and how much the, uh, the IT sector um, matters in that space. Um, so not only does the IT decisions in any one department and agency matter to that department and agency, but they take and add risk across the whole of government. So what you may not have heard about recently is we had a, a smaller, lesser breach in the federal government um, that was a cross-agency activity. So Department of Education puts up a uh, website that helps you apply for loans, grants, um, and is a basis for scholarships as well. Um, so, so in that application, um, the, uh, the FAFSA, for those of you who have college kids, um, in the FAFSA, you've got to prove your, um, your financial um, basis for applying for those loans and scholarships and other things. So there's a, a huge amount of financial information you have to put in and then verify. So in 
in good government fashion, they went ahead and said, let's not have people retype this and then re-verify it. Let's make a connection to the IRS and bring that data in. Well, unfortunately, when they did that, there wasn't strong validation and verification. And people found out that they could go to the FAFSA ap application and with a minimal amount of PII, pull down financial information from IRS. And they were using that channel. Now, the good news is they found it early, they shut it down, it's being remediated. But in the meantime, you have to manually enter your financial data um, for the FAFSA program. But this is one example where not considering the whole of the system brought risk from one area into another. And those things happen every day in our companies and in our government. So with this executive order, we've really stepped back and said, we're going to manage the federal um, information technology activity as an enterprise. We're gonna step back and even though it's, it's millions upon millions of assets, even though it's thousands upon thousands of networks, um, we're going to step back and try to view that as the sum total of risks. So one of the immediate things in the EO is just getting departments and agencies to say, hey, here's the risks I've decided to take. And one of those risks may be as simple as, I still have XP in my, in my infrastructure for a reason. Or it may be that I have this specific computer or this specific application that the industry is end of life, but I can't replace, it's irreplaceable and I continue to operate it. So understanding that that's in your infrastructure is the first step in then planning mitigations. Because mitigation may not be replacing or upgrading, it may be just added defenses around it. Uh, so, so looking at that as an enterprise is a, uh, is a change and a shift in the way we do federal, uh, federal cybersecurity. Um, Additionally, you know, those of you who work incident response or work in the, uh, the red team areas know that um, we will never stop a motivated intruder, right? If somebody is well resourced and they are really insistent on getting to your data, um, in the end, you know, you can mitigate, you can understand, you can slow down, uh, but chances are people can get to your data. And so we have to understand that if we drive out every single vulnerability known, known to exist out of a network today, um, tomorrow there's gonna to be some security researcher understanding a new vulnerability or developing a new technique um, that puts that data at risk again. So we really have to understand we're not gonna be perfect at keeping intruders out. So we have to have methods to detect those breaches early, um, defend against them, and then compartmentalize so that they don't cascade into massive, massive data losses. Um, for that, you can't defend a network if you don't understand what, what it's comprised of. And so that is another piece of our effort is really to get a handle on what's inside our networks. And so for those of you in industry, I would really encourage you to, to ask, you know, do you absolutely know what's in your network? Um, you know, in, in past life, I worked uh, the defensive side at NSA, and when we responded to breaches, uh, the first question is, you know, give me your network diagram, and inevitably, that network diagram differed from the reality that had been implemented. And so the question is, how much did it differ? Um, and that often was a measure of, you know, how high quality that team was that was defending the network. Because if they really had no idea what was in their network, they had no chance to secure it. So from the federal side, we have to get to the point where we understand what's in that network um, and so that we have the chance to uh, defend it. One way we intend to do that um, is a new emphasis on shared services in our future IT procurements. And that cuts to a couple different areas. One area is, um, I mentioned, you know, where the Bureau of Reclamation has to go up against um, the cyber recruiting people at DHS and CIA and FBI um, and, and who's going to get that talent, right? Where's the sexy job? Where's the interesting job? One of the ways we can help to manage to have that same high quality of activity is shared services. So if there is a service provider that is providing those capabilities with the expertise, the top end talent for the smaller, less, um, less technical agencies and departments, um, they raise the, the, the rising tide raises all boats. And that's our, that's our focus there. Additionally, um, we expect by having some managed services 
that we get to a refresh rate that is more reasonable, that we're able to get into um, service-based architectures that we can continually roll and move to newer technology because in the end, older technologies are much harder to defend. Um, make no bones about it, you know, the federal government can't afford to refresh all of our IT in one fell swoop. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But we can take those risk evaluation areas where departments and agencies know they've taken risk and use those as the low-hanging fruit to feed into the things we're going to modernize um, and improve. The other effort is um, we have to be practical on our security advice. Um, you can make a system so secure that it's insecure because people won't use it. I'm sure all of you have been victim to 20 letter passcodes that need upper lower case and get re refreshed every two months and you know what you've done is you've fallen back to some sort of system to help you remember that that in the end is much less secure than the one you would have picked had you not been subject to those rules. So we're looking pragmatically at security, not just raising the bar by raising the technology, but looking at the human factors in that as well. And I would encourage you to do that as, uh, as well. Um, and then finally, it's not enough to just improve protection. Um, we have to improve resilience. Because as I said before, we expect there will be breaches. Um, and, and in that, you have to have the plans and the capabilities to recover from those breaches and to minimize the consequences of the breaches when they do happen. Um, so, second priority in the uh, in the the executive order was the uh, the enhancement of securing our critical infrastructure. Most of that is owned and operated by the private sector, uh, and so in that area we have defined 16 sectors that are considered critical infrastructure in the United States. And they include everything from the power industry to the banking industry to the medical industry to communications, right? 16 sectors. But what makes this hard is they're all interdependent. If the power industry goes down, how long does the communication sector last? Um, that long. Um, the, the water, um, that, that feeds our cities um, also has a short amount of time that without power it can last. If the communication system goes down, um, banking is not going to continue. So, so with those <coughs> interrelated, interdependent systems, um, we understand that we are probably not in the state we need to be today um, to, s to survive deliberate or natural hazards against some of our, our critical infrastructure. And so we really need to, in partnership and collaboration with private sector, understand where we can improve those defenses. And so the first round of the executive order is really building that, that effort to collaborate and find the places the government can lean in with private industry, whether it be improved regulation that raises the, uh, the, the capability of everybody in the sector, or getting rid of regulation that gets in the way because it drives people to make decisions based on previous year's rules that no longer are really state-of-the-art encouragement for cybersecurity. We're also going to work on ways to leverage the knowledge the government has on advanced persistent threats and utilize those insights into defense of the critical infrastructure. So one of the things um, you heard about today was um, was the sharing programs that will that will distribute threat information across the industry. Um, those are the connected places that we're working to drive some of the intelligence insights we have into those same defenses in the critical infrastructure space. Um, just like the federal networks need to be resilient, we need to assume that the, the uh, critical infrastructure space will hit, will take hits, and we need to work on the containing the damage and being able to restore capability quickly. So one of the areas that that requires is um, plans and exercises. So the federal government does really well in thinking about natural hazards like flood, fire, tornado, hurricanes. Um, we even do a lot on um, biohazards, nuclear hazards. Um, we've run exercises on cyber, but I don't think they're sufficient yet. I don't think we play, we practice like we're going to play. 
uh, when a crisis goes down, do we understand, do we have the playbook that we can open it and government and industry understands the roles and capabilities they provide and what solutions each brings to that place? Especially in a cyber event where it may be that the government has critical classified intelligence on the underlying cause of that cyber event. Do we know how we as industry who's going to stand at the podium in that event talks about the, the, the event that's underway while at the same time Washington has a view um, and how do we connect those two views and make sure that we're, we're mutually informed. So in the critical infrastructure space, we were looking for something very tangible that we could work on immediately with industry, and we picked the distributed denial of service and IoT botnets as an activity. Um, recent events, the Mirai botnet and others showed how, just how vulnerable we are to a growing population of technology that's been pushed into the ecosystem, often without really strong plans for security. So as those devices can be co-opted and used to, to, um, to, to push bits at an unsuspecting target, or they're used to manipulate data on the way to a critical process, um, do we have ways to protect them? And so we're gonna launch a, an effort jointly with industry on a voluntary basis where we look at driving botnets down and out. Uh, there are things where, where traffic crosses network boundaries and we know that that traffic is no good. Um, the question is, why do we continue to hand it off and be a participant in that problem? And I think we've got some great industry partners who are gonna look at that and try to understand how they can squash some of the traffic at network boundaries um, that they know is spoofed, falsified, or malicious. And, and that'll be a big deal in protecting our infrastructure. So the third priority, um, the third pillar in the EO, was um, looking at the broader international space. Um, we look for an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure global internet um, that benefits both the US and the rest of the world. Um, we, we really, if you think about it, we built the internet and we gave it to the world. It's very important that it continues to reflect our values. And there are others around the world who don't share those same values about that open, inter in interconnected, um, global commons um, that we've seen such value in. If you look at what the internet has done um, in improving our business, our technology, our way of life, it's really important that we continue those standards and, and continue to make sure um, that, that it survives for the generations. So we're going ahead with some confidence building measures between states. Um, you know, one of the risks in international, um, in the international environment is just misperception or escalation in the event of a, a cyber event. Um, so confidence building between, between nations is, all, is important to us. And while we in the U.S. are committed to, to stability in cyberspace, um, we don't assume all other nations have that same um, understanding or that same goal. Um, so with that, we're looking for other like-minded countries to build these norms and these, uh, and these agreements that will allow us to drive down malicious behavior. Um, we're not going to let other nations hold us at risk through the use of cyber. And having a clear deterrence strategy, um, which really, of course, includes improving our defenses and resilience, because if other nations aren't confident they can achieve the effects they want, um, it lessens the chance that they will even try. Um, so, so we will find that deterrence in cyberspace doesn't always come from cyber itself. So cyber back on cyber. Um, but we have a lot of elements of power in the, uh, in the US um, to include all our statecraft, sanctions, criminal, um, uh, criminal warrants and, and indictments. Um, as well as economic and technical capabilities. So we'll use all elements of national power in working on this deterrence um, to keep to the global norms in cyberspace. One of the key factors for us though is making sure that people understand there's consequences for unacceptable behavior on the internet. And you know, just as we have in the past, we're gonna use those elements of national power to, to uh, push those consequences for disruptive behavior.
So I'll finish, I mentioned three pillars, but there's a fourth um, underlying foundation to that, uh, to that executive order, and that is um, looking at the way we build and uh, improve the cyber skills and capacity of the nation. And so you'll see in the executive order um, a call out to the NICE activity um, and, and a bunch of work to look at what capacity, what skills and capabilities we need, um, both for government and industry. Um, because it really starts with a solid base of a pyramid um, and that the, the desires for this talent and our needs for the innovation are only growing. Um, so we're gonna keep investing in that. So as, as we press ahead, you know, I'd ask you to think about, um, you know, our priorities in the cybersecurity arena and, and think about, um, we have to build this knowing that the technology is shifting and changing rapidly, right? We're trying not to have something that is reflective of today's, um, today's snapshot in time. I would, um, I would offer that 10 years ago, um, none of us had an iPhone. And if you think about, if you think about what you're carrying today in a computer that is connected to the global, uh, the global internet, where you can reach out from this room and touch the totality of human knowledge across all time, you can know where you are on the planet with the GPS in that, you can take a video, you can communicate, you can reach out to massive amounts of big data sitting out in the cloud, uh, you can check your bank balances. You can um, you can go out and make purchases. There is this massive amount of activity. My kids will never be lost again, right? They will never grow up knowing what it is like to, to have made three wrong turns and not have any clue about where you are and get back to a known point, right? As long as they have battery, they know where they are, right? The power of that thing and its impact on our society has been mind-boggling over the last 10 years. Um, and so, you know, I can't even fathom what it's going to be like in another 10. I do know, you know, the Internet of Things is upon us, and more and more of our ecosystem and the things around us interacting with us, um, observing us and, and participating in our lives is going to grow. And so getting the cybersecurity thing is really important to do right. Um, and we're putting a lot of investment and focus on it. So I'll end there. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to talk and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate that. And I think uh, I'm really impressed with uh, the uh, executive order so far. I think there's been some significant uh, progress going forward. Um, I would, uh, you were talking uh, towards the end about uh, relations uh, with uh, other states, other uh, geographies. Um, one of the uh, difficulties that we in the cyber, cyber field, the security field, uh, working for an internationally uh, active uh, SaaS company, I've seen is uh, some inherent distrust earned uh, over years or decades perhaps uh, with regards to privacy, given that there are different uh, cultural norms uh, uh, elsewhere versus here. So are you addressing that at all in uh, uh, the short term? Is there something on your agenda or how would you uh, recommend the private sector to, to express that these kind of concerns or deal with those kind of concerns when they come from international customers or partners? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so great question. We, we are very mindful of the differing norms in privacy. Um, you know, I would also offer that um, as you look around, um, you know, one of our core tenants is an open uh, and secure internet. As you look around the world, um, not every country shares that value. And in fact, one of the dangers we're looking at are a series of walled gardens where in the name of cybersecurity, other countries are looking um, to, to give themselves more understanding about their population and maybe even use the technologies to support the regime. And so we're actively working against that. Right? I think, you know, in the, the ability to have communications um, to, to, to um, uphold the rule of law, um, but not have that then turned against the, the, the population of a country is really an important value that we'll support. Yes. Hi, Rob. Yes. Thanks so much for being here with us today. I really yes. appreciate it. So um, let me tell you who I am, because I know I always appreciate when I get a question. I'm Edna Conway, uh, and I'm the Chief Security Officer on? for Cisco. I can't, can't hear you. Is that on? Oh, it's not on? 
Let me have my colleague to the left. Check well, for me. it's not for me. There we go. You're on. Better now? No. <laughs> hey, Rob, can you hear me now? It's on. It's on. I'm Edna Conway. I'm the Chief Security Officer for the Global Value Chain in Cisco. And I am so excited to see things like cyber supply chain security risk management in the framework. My colleagues at NIST, Interact 1.1, as well as um, NERC actually responding to FERC's requirements and putting something in the SIP about that. I'm curious. It is referenced in the EO, um, presumptively in the defense arena. But when we talk about the world in which we live today, right, where we have this digital transformation, the concept of there's us and them doesn't exist anymore, right? There's only us. Global comments. And, and so the reality is I'm curious as to whether or not you are focusing. I think we're still a little bit um, ahead of the curve in, in the technology industry thinking about those connections, we see them. I'm not sure other industries see them and are addressing the third party ecosystem. So I'd be curious as to what your plans are for embracing that third party ecosystem in a holistic way. Yeah. So, so I think we're going to um, start with the federal government. We're gonna experiment on ourselves. So you heard me say that we need to um, use shared services. We need to push more into industry spaces. And by doing that, we're going to test ourselves a bit in that third-party ecosystem because what we're going to see is that movement you talked about in commercial industry being pulled into the government um, and them taking, to play, taking us to places that are probably a little uncomfortable for us today. Um, we've got to find a way that we can put our data in a commercial cloud um, but at the same time understand that when we as a government know that there's a nation state threat against that cloud we can talk to that provider give them the threat information and then um, be assured that they did the right thing inside there to secure the data um, for the people and and today um, we do have some worries in that space watching some of the ways industry has responded to breaches in um, in some of the data centers and so finding a way to be able to connect back and leverage that commercial technology well um, the whole ecosystem is changing around it to be <coughs> global um, that's going to be a challenge for us thank you hi uh, jeff engel reporter with x economy um two questions uh, number one are there any new ways that the federal government is going to work with cybersecurity companies and, and industry besides grants and customer relationships uh, and then number two you know, will there be any consideration given to companies possible ties to uh, foreign governments i know kaspersky lab came up in a recent senate intelligence committee meeting um so uh, if, if you have any thoughts on that issue as well sure so I'll start with your first new ways. Um, there is a uh, there's a new effort in this administration called the Office of American Innovation, um, and and inside that, Chris Liddell um, and Reed Cordish are pulling together a group of um, uh, from industry um, next month. And so I'm not going to steal their thunder, but I think that will be an excellent place to understand what we're doing to try to shake some of the bureaucracy and the procurement uh, methodology of the past and to get a little more into the technology life cycle that commercial industry is able to propose. And, and by doing that, it does mean that we'll have to have new vehicles and new ways of working with commercial industry. And then uh, to your second question about companies, um, make no mistakes, you know, the federal government um, and our critical infrastructure um, are, are part of our national security apparatus. And so in doing commercial inclusion, um, we have to be very confident that we're doing the right thing by national security. And so at times that will mean decisions that we have to, um, we have to focus in on the threats a company may bring. Right here. So similar to your comments about data private industry areas, um, in line with that prioritization of shared services, there's a greater need for third-party risk management practices, which is arguably something that's still maturing industry-wide. Do you see programs like FedRAMP being enhanced as part of that direction? I think it has to. Um, I, I think it, it needs to advance, again, 
just to be competitive with the new ideas. Every day, um, industry is coming up with a new way and a new scheme to provide services um, to, to broader, innovative ways into broader ecosystems. And we've got to be able to take advantage of that. And, and in using those new and innovative things, um, if we're going to include cybersecurity, and it has to be included from the beginning, um, we've got to marry those together. Um, so we'll be putting a lot of thought into not just jumping on the new thing because it's newer or cheaper, but how does the new thing in improve our cybersecurity? And in most cases, we can um, move to the new and improve security at the same time. So we're going to consider those intertwined. Um, you know, going back to my earlier comment of you can make a thing so secure it's insecure. Um, you know, sometimes the security rules don't make you more secure; they're just more rules. And so it's it's a focus on what are we doing to practically improve that security that's going to uh, that, that's going to bring you in and make it acceptable to to adopt that new service. No, actually, we good? got we got a line got going. Sorry. Yep. Uh, my name is Noel Zamata. I run a small firm that actually designs uh, resiliency, so resiliency into the, the systems. And following up on that, but we had a discussion last week, actually, in all things, in a autonomous vehicles working group about the. Uh, the role of policy, both federal and at the state level, to actually incentivize exactly what you're talking about. Can you speak a little bit deeper on that? Uh, the two sides, to make it very simple, uh, on one side, people are basically saying, you know, we have a lot of policy that says thou shalt do this, but nothing that says thou shalt think about this better. And on the other side, there's a lot of folks who are considerably, obviously concerned that too much policy is actually going to stifle innovation. Can you shed some light on that? I can give you some personal thoughts. Um, the, the interesting thing about policy as it pertains to national security is there is usually not a business justification for national security. And, and so that's where the tension comes in, is to find that sweet spot that allows us um, to make the right decisions that, that support national security, but at the same time keeps you agile, innovative, um, reasonably cost, reasonably costed, um, and uh, open and competitive, and so it's finding that sweet spot. And I think we'll we'll play with the dials a bit again, um, just because industry has moved so far beyond where some of the specific policy limitations exist today. Um, I think you know an example of. Um, you know, a challenge people have when you go to the wanna cry um, activity. Um, you know, one of the requirements is that you, you be current and patched in your IT in the, in the healthcare industry. But at the same time, um, if you want to patch and change some critical health services equipment, um, you may need FDA uh, re uh, uh, a re-examination and a reauthorization in that space and it can take months um, and so you know that process is at odds with uh, I want to be current and patched um, and at a time where it, if you're looking at a CAT scanner that may take four or five years to develop the odds are the operating system you started with at the beginning of that development is almost end of life by the time it's coming out and now when you open that hospital, literally open the side wall of that hospital, put this massive machine in, seal the hospital back up, and expect to, uh, to run that machine for 10 or 15 years, um, we have to think about how you're gonna secure it because patching's not gonna be the only option. Chances are there's gonna be unsupportable things in there. So what's your strategy to have controls around that that make it acceptable that in the middle of that MRI imager is XP and that XP is not gonna be vulnerable to something like the WannaCry um, example. Hi, I'm uh, John Rickinson with Thanks Computing. Uh, so I've yet another question about uh, industry outreach and technology innovation. It turns out uh, in the greater Boston area, there's kind of a, a very strong ecosystem of co companies making new and interesting cybersecurity technologies. One thing you said that I thought was uh, interesting is uh, you gave one particular example, cross-border uh, monitoring. 
and that you were, had confidence in certain vendors that were, you were helping you were helping you with that problem. Um, part of the part of the challenge is the vendors that tend to be picked are the ones that are large, have a brand name, have people in Washington. What can we do as a local community here to get the uh, the new and innovative technologies, of which there are a lot, properly exposed so that a problem that you're aware of gets mapped onto new, better, even cheaper ways of doing things. So I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a cop out, but I would ask you to wait for that uh, that activity that we're kicking off in the Office of American Innovation. I think you're going to see some really cool things coming out of that. Um, in the meantime, I would encourage you to, to play in this ecosystem when there's critical mass in an area. Um, I think will be connecting to those venues to find new technologies, new companies, um, and, and even innovative processes to understand where those are not connecting into the big federal government. I see you again. Could you please help me understand with the erosion of net neutrality, uh, which has eroded international trust in the United States government and in doing um, eco economic business over the internet with U.S. companies. Um, why are we going in that direction when we have a stated notion that we're trying to foster partnership with other countries of like lives regarding internet security? So I think when you look at net neutrality, that is one of the sticky decisions that has to be made in the regulator space. Uh, the uh, the the activities that go on in the internet, for example, the thing I was talking about earlier, when we know there are bad packets coming from, from um, an ISP overseas that only serves phishing emails, that's all that company does, is it will take the highest bidder to put malware into the ecosystem. You need the ability of the, the, the ISPs to be able to knock down that traffic or we're all gonna suffer from the criminals who are overseas just looking to steal our money, lock up our systems, hold our technology for ransom. Um, we've gotta find a balance point between there where we allow some changes and some things to be unacceptable on the net. Um, and, and if you're just gonna have a bent pipe that lets everything straight through, um, you're inviting people through your unlocked door. Mm -hmm. Yes. I uh, can carry from the Sibley Austin law firm. Uh, one of the opportunities for uh, public private uh, cooperation is in the disclosure of exploits and, uh, that, uh, that the federal government has. And the WannaCry uh, attacks is one of the, appears to have come from the shadow brokers, and one of a series of uh, vulnerabilities that have been disclosed there. Uh, there is this. Uh, you know, well, prior experience, the vulnerabilities equities process to, uh, to disclose uh, some of those uh, exploits so that the industry can respond. Uh, uh, there's uh, the legislation that uh, might uh, codify some of the policies that have been in place on that. Uh, where are you in terms of thinking about uh, uh, making the vulnerabilities equities process work better uh, looking at that, that legislation and uh, increasing uh, cooperation in, in getting uh, patches out uh, for, for those kinds of vulnerabilities. Sure. So, you know, the first thing, you know, I think everybody needs to understand is, as, as I've been up here talking, um, you know, we've got a favor defense. And I'll tell you the vulnerabilities equities process actually does favor defense today. Um, in my new role um, on the, as the White House Cybersecurity Coordinator, I actually chair that board. Um, so, so it's run out of the White House. It considers vulnerabilities and understands um, you know, how significant the vulnerability is. Is it used in government? Is it used in critical infrastructure? Are there mitigations such as patches and other things available? Um, it convenes a whole of government body, um, folks like NIST, um, DHS Commerce participate in that, as do some of the intelligence organizations, NSA, CIA, FBI. Um, and, and in that, um, 
the, the, the scales are set to favor and understand that in the end we've got to, we've got to protect. Um, but there will be occasions where for national security we need a capability um, to go out and do some collection. And so that's where we make non-black and white decisions about when a, when a vulnerability needs to, be, um, needs to be withheld. And so across that, there is effort, as you mentioned, um, to legislate the process. Um, we're working with Congress to talk about it right now. Um, I do have concerns just because um, that legislation is talking about moving that to a non-neutral entity. Um, and you know, I really think that the process today out of the White House gives it the balance where we don't have the offense or the defense side with too much thumb on the skin. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, deterrence. So um, I work for MathWorks, we're a medium-sized software company. When I think about what role I can play in deterrence, I think about shrinking my attack surface not being an easy target, being very good at detection, and participating in threat intel activities. One thing that I almost never think about is attack attribution. And I wanted to see from your perspective in the deterrence uh, arena, how important is attack attribution and what role might I play in that? So attribution can help in deterrence because if we can name and shame with authority, um, there, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of community pressure that can be brought. So when there's ambiguity, there there is a um, a little less um, leverage um, deterrence. Um, but I will tell you, perfect attribution doesn't have to happen, and at times, perfect public attribution doesn't have to happen because we do have um, a strong intel community and we have friends around the world who help us in that space. Uh, the one thing I would encourage you is, you know, when the government comes out and says it's country X, um, the amount of lawyers we have that review that before we're allowed to say it, um, it's a high confidence statement. Um, you know, when, when people are saying it in the press or they, they assume or, or are, are pushing things out there um, as, uh, as assumptions, uh, might not be as high confidence, but if the government has come out and said, we know X did Y, um, it, it's a high confidence statement, and we're not always gonna bring the data and the facts out to, for public review, uh, but it's a high confidence fact. We do at times rely a lot on private industry to help us with that, so as you're sharing indicators of compromise with FBI and DHS, um, that is also going into the soup of the intel community where they can take those leads and then use sources and methods to build on that. Um, and so it's, it's a huge help. So I would encourage you in the data sharing and, and collaboration space where you can work with um, you know, those incident responders and others that really does make a big difference. Hi, I'm a reporter from the uh, State House News Service. I was wondering, any lessons learned from the DNC hacking of uh, last year? Yeah, so I think a few takeaways. Um, in the end, you need to really be careful with your security. Um, and I think overall, cybersecurity can't be overrated with people who will have folks that you know are seeking to get their data. Um, that, that's the number one thing is, I, as I move around in um, public circles, as I move around with industry, people don't understand when, uh, uh, when they're a target. If you look at commercial industry and you know some of the trade secrets that have been lost, um, those companies probably didn't understand as acutely as they should that they were a target. And so, um, you know, we've lost, some, we've lost some important things over time. The other thing is we've moved from a time where information is being stolen to, to um, use the information to a point in time where information is stolen and then it's cascaded into other operations. And I think that's a turning point for all of us in understanding how stolen information is going to be used and leveraged. Um, so that, that for me, was the personal learning experience. Hi. Um, uh, 
so uh, I work for a, a large research university here. We do a lot of work also in cybersecurity. And I was curious if you could comment, please, on uh, how you expect the funding uh, environment to change, uh, specifically in light of the executive order, as well as this Office of American Innovation. Do you expect there to be any parity between the funding of, uh, of research in uh, universities as well? Yeah. I, I'm apologizing because I'm going to have to take a pass on that one. I just have no data for you. I don't know that it's going in one direction or the other. I know this EO doesn't, doesn't push it in one direction or the other. So apologies. Uh, first, thank you for being here today. Hans Olsen, Assistant Under Secretary of Homeland Security of Massachusetts. What role do you see um, states playing in this fabric of cybersecurity? Um, states have an important role, um, you know, especially as it relates to our critical infrastructure. Um, much of the critical infrastructure is supported or regulated by the states, and so. Um, with that, the decisions you make at the state level um, can impact the national critical infrastructure writ large. As you look at the, the way you can regulate, for instance, the power industry in the state of Massachusetts, um, you have a lever on their ability to defend themselves, to um, recapitalize their infrastructure, to reinvest in better cybersecurity. Um, but at the same time, Massachusetts is part of the national grid. It's actually part of the North American grid. So a failure in Massachusetts cascades to the East Coast, can cascade to um, North America. And so you know the role you play um, can't be understated. And as I look to the way, um, for example, the financial sector reinvests and is constantly able to improve against a changing threat landscape. Um, I, I have worries about the power industry because as a regulated entity, they don't have the agility and the, the, the nimbleness to reinvest to that new threat and to uh, recapitalize on some of the known threats that, that are coming at their industry. So you know, I would encourage you at the state level, um, really um, get to intimately know the critical infrastructure folks and ask them what they need in terms of state support, state regulation, or even regulation relief so that they can then be ready to support um, their bigger role in the national future. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If there is one more question. 